first start the show. Great, thank you. Eleni is in from, oh good, and Ildefonso from um, Cuba. Buenos dias. Wow. Hello. Oh, I want to go there. Not been to Cuba. Hello, Cuba. That's great. That's great. Uh, I can introduce you to Eduardo. Yeah. He'd be interested. He would be interested. Actually, in the chat, which countries are represented here by the current participants? Mexico. Yes. Well, I know Mexico really well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, we have Cuba. We have Cyprus. We have Greece. We have um, mm -hmm. um, France. I think we have um, we have all of so, you. Yeah. Edinburgh, just Venezuela. down the road. Duo Luan. Well, I'm in Glasgow. I'm English, but I live in Glasgow. It is possible, apparently. Uh, Tuscan, Italy. Greece, oh, you're all, you're all, <laughs> all the sunshine countries. Uh, Edinburgh's probably sunny. We've got snow today. Well, yeah. I think you should be very careful here because Duo Luan is actually in Edinburgh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I can see that. Yeah, hello from Edinburgh. Well, they get a lot of sun and dry wind. We get the rain from, well, we blame the Irish for giving us all their rain mm. uh, in the west of Scotland. Um, <laughs> Augsburg, yeah, guten Abend, guten Tag. Servus, servus. Servus, guten Tag. Ich hatte, ja, ich schon lange her, seit ich in Augsburg war, aber das war damals ein ganz schöne Käsespätzle und ein Weißbier dazu. Das war ganz schön und das vermisse ich sehr. Muss ich sagen. <laughs> oh my God, I just realized, yes, because I've taught in Augsburg as well, the university, Katrine, I did seminars there. Wonderful. Well, well, well known. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Happy to hear. That's yeah. Great. Lovely. Yeah, but I'm gonna, we're going to miss the uh, Weihnachtfest. Uh, yeah. Which is really lovely in the marketplace in um, yes, Augsburg. Yes, true. Well, we'll have another one next year, I'm sure. <laughs> and, not, and just down the road, uh, Munich, I wonder, are they going to have the Oktoberfest this year? Or is it still not certain? I don't know. Nothing is official, but I think so. They'll go ahead. It's yes. important, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Özlem, why yes. don't you pull us all to order so we start? Okay, okay let's start. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. On behalf of the ICC Languages, I'd like to say it's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Andy Cowell, who will be presenting Turning a New, a new Page, Why Students Don't Like Reading and How to Change It. Uh, during the talk, keep your microphones muted until the Q&A se Q session starts. So um, you may also use the chat box for your questions. And Barry, over to you. Okay, well, very quickly an introduction. Thanks, Ursula. Um, as you may have heard from the um, chat going on between uh, Andy and me, we've known each other a few years. Uh, we've worked together at conferences around, um, around Europe. Um, and uh, also, of course, um, I always remember when we had a wonderful um, a session in, um, um, in Glasgow when they had the IATEFL seminar there, you ran this wonderful party. And that was actually a great seminar. So basically, um, I think Richard was there too. Um, and really, really, really good fun. So basically, um, what I uh, want to say is, I'm really looking forward to the presentation. We've worked together on things before. I've heard you present. I know how exciting and how much fun it is. What more can I say? Thank you. Thank you, Barry. All right. Well, look, um, I'll just share my quickly share my screen. Um, and um, if I could ask you to mute could you please mute microphone. yourself. OK, so if you can mute your microphones, I'm going to put it here very politely. Please mute. Microphones. Uh, and I'm doing that so as well, uh, Andy. I'm trying to mute everybody. That's great, actually. You can. That's great, yeah, isn't it? It's, yeah, it's powerful. Yeah. You can. You can yeah. cut everybody off. Okay, I did that. That's so great. First of all, can you all see? Um, you can just put yes or no. Can you see my title slide? Why students don't like reading and how to change it. Can you all? No problem. Very clear. Okay, great. Um, well, I'm going to just steam ahead. If you want to chip in and ask anything or put in the chat, that's fine. Um, and I'm aware that um, I may tell some of you things you know already, uh, which is fine. Maybe you can add things to help me along the way. But I'm going to come at this from very much the perspective of uh, someone who's worked in English language teaching and, and also the training and publishing part of that 
for 35 years, if you include uh, my teaching years, which were in Germany mostly. And before that, I, I studied German and linguistics at the University of Newcastle upon Tyne. So my whole life has been uh, a language learning journey and morphed in the last 15 years as a consultant and freelancer to um, demonstrate the creative use of materials in the classroom. So I'm a writer as well, but predominantly I like to get my hands dirty, roll up my sleeves, get into the classroom, I wish, uh, and certainly maybe online and help teachers to use materials that they have more creatively, as opposed to open your books at unit five and let's do exercise one and exercise two. And we know that doesn't do anybody any good and it's often demotivating and a lot of teachers do make a creative effort. But one thing that's gone wrong ever since I was at school and before that and before that and still is we have a broken system regarding uh, the way, well, the way we use reading texts in the language teaching classroom. So what I'm going to say today applies to modern foreign languages, but I'm coming at this as uh, an ELT, English language teaching publishing professional. And there are two sort of agendas really. One is um, it's, wide, it's widely misunderstood what reading, uh, how it can be approached in the classroom. And the second point is um, what we mean by reading is often misinterpreted by the system around the world, including our own country in the UK, about the way texts are used to test or introduce language rather than a way to give meaningful and supportive practice. Now that all sounds very vague and uh, interesting, but I'm gonna demonstrate what I have found for many years to be very eye-opening for many teachers. Um, and I have, a, I have a real passion for what I'm gonna tell you next. And I am merely a very passionate believer and, mes and messenger in this uh this presentation this what i'm going to show you will make a lot of sense it follows absolute common sense and logic and the evidence the academic evidence around the world supports that what i'm going to show you is more powerful than taking a grammar based journey through a course book independently um, but the system doesn't seem to like it. And you'll see what I mean as we go through. So enough of that kind of preamble. But um, if you follow the logic and if you're a teacher, you may find that as there'll be a point during the presentation where you realize, oh, I see. Ah, but in my country, we can't do that. And I say to the countries I visit, and I've done this in 40 countries for nearly 20 years, this can work. It does work, but you need to make some changes in what we think is language teaching and how we get students to present. Plus, of course, that huge, huge problem now, which is the sort of diminishing reading culture, which I'll also try to address. But uh, let's see if you can follow what I'm gonna do here. And I have to thank uh, the, what we call the extensive reading community of teachers who started this in the eighties, I would imagine. Barry can help me out there. So this, what I'm showing you today is not new. It's 30, 40 years old as an approach, which is absolutely effective and would be something I wish I had had when I was a student of uh, French and German back at school. And I think I just want to start with this lovely picture. This is what we wish for our students. Uh, I'm deliberately picking a child, a boy here who is, you know, so passionate about reading that he's, you know, He's hiding it from his parents. He's, on, he's gone to bed. He said he's going to go gaming, but he's really reading. And of course, there's something very sort of old fashioned about this picture now, I suppose. Uh, for one thing, he's using a torch, <laughs> not a light from his smartphone. And he's also so, so in love with reading that he's, you know, he's got a big thick book under his covers and he's not using his smartphone. We'll come to smartphones in a moment. Uh, and also that's a different presentation on how I go around the world where I can to get teachers to read and they don't read by and large. They don't, they all shuffle a bit uncomfortably in presentations when I look at them. Um, but I'll come back to that too without judgment and fully with compassion to urge us to rediscover our reading habits. There's always somebody who puts up their hand and tells me that they still read. But 90%, I would say, are, of my audiences are teachers who don't read. They're, they're teachers and they like to think they read but they don't. And I'm going to talk about reading habits because what we want 
is for students to leave school with a reading habit in their own language and in a foreign language. And it won't happen if we continue to do what we do with them already, which is drag them through course books and use reading as a testing mechanism. We drag them through course books and we give them reading as a testing mechanism, not reading for pleasure. And when we start to tell our parents we're going to help the students read for pleasure, they think it sounds great. And then when they realize it involves giving up time in the classroom and homework to do easy reading, not difficult reading, not tested reading, everybody gets uncomfortable because there's a, there's a widely held belief, un, not written down by the world, by everybody, that learning a language, the practice must be difficult. And I'm going to argue the case that not all the practice should be difficult it should be quite easy in fact and through that you can get a reading fluency that has enormous benefits um, but what of course is lost is this is not typical this is what kids think about reading uh, again i've put a boy there but it could be anybody um, yeah there are gender statistics about boys reading less than girls and whatever but i think that the school schools around the world don't this is not a result you can argue with me if you wish but I've never really had anybody, anybody put up their hand and say that oh no this is what we get at the end of school I say to teachers despite your best efforts this is the attitude that children leave school with about reading and you know we know why I'm just going to go into that now before we look at what's gone wrong let's just you can tell me or you can put in the chat what do we gain from reading what is what is our experience of reading in the real world? Outside? Once we leave school, what do we hope reading brings us? What do you hope reading books will bring you? There's only a few answers and they're never the ones that really they get in school. Well, I'll tell you, um, you can disagree or add more, but I think generally these are the, oh, I put five things. Um, a break, yes, enjoyment. Uh, escape reality, exactly. You can escape in books. And I think when I'm talking about reading today, I'm talking about the reading of, let's say, novels. I'm not saying reading for prof professional development. I'm not talking about reading linguistics books. I'm talking about reading novels or whatever it is that helps you read for pleasure. It could be nonfiction, but I'm not talking about reading for study. We read for pleasure or we want, let's just say the goal is that we read for pleasure that we then can relax and of course we escape into other worlds. That sounds like a cliche, but it's true. And we learn as we read, we learn about the world, we learn new words, uh, we learn about the lives of others. And of course that whole important newish area of uh, inclusion in the curriculum for teaching soft skills, life skills. You know, as we read books, there's always dilemmas and conflicts, relationships to be negotiated. And of course, as the more you read, the more you see how different people in different times and cultures work those relationships. And you can get that from watching films, but of course, in a different session where I compare film story with the actual stories in books, you can obviously see there's a huge difference uh, between what we can gain from a film, which I love. Barry will tell you how much I love films. But if you were to, to watch Frankenstein, for example, you wouldn't really know without reading the book that how much is from the creature's perspective and how actually it's not about a monster, it's about how the humans are the monsters. And so reading books, of course, allows us to get really inside the minds of the characters. Now, you know all this. I'm not telling you anything new. But is that really what the students receive as uh, an experience? And I would say they don't. This is why they think they read uh, books. We read for these purposes. That's what we want them to know. We like to think with our best efforts as teachers that this is what they're going to get. But the experience they receive day in, day out, week in, month in, out, year in, for 15 years, is this. We only read to learn English language. Now, of course, I'm thinking of English as a foreign language here. I come at this from the perspective of teaching English as a foreign language. So if you teach French, if you teach German, you know, I'm talking about when they read in that language, they realize the only reason they're reading it is to learn the language and to pass the tests, to do comprehension questions, to do multiple choice. 
Now, let's just stop and think about that. Children are very sort of uh, impressionable. If you take a child out of their playful years at home at the age of four or five, put them in school, and then for the next 10 years or more, we don't really give them any other reading than look at this text, I'm going to teach you how to understand it, and then you do it, you're going to do a comprehension check at the end of it. And then you, you kind of condition the child through into the teenage years to come out of the playful experiential enjoyment of story and play and narrative into, oh no, here's another text. I know why I'm reading this. The teacher thinks I'm gonna be interested in dolphins and volcanoes or whatever, but the reality is I'm only reading this text because it's gonna be followed by either questions or an essay. Now, I know the system demands that of us. That doesn't mean that I believe the system's correct, by the way, but for the purposes of getting the students prepared, what we do is, and this is, <laughs> we all know this, um, and I wish the system would change, I think, and come at this from a very, very ambitious level. I want teachers to change their own classrooms, but I would love to think that rather than preparing students to take tests, you know, we could follow more Scandinavian models where they are freer in how they approach their subjects and their timetables and even not even having homework at all. But for the purposes of this slide, I just want to capture here the, 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 the very, very destructive uh, disconnect between what we get from reading, what we hope they will do in their grown up lives with books, but how we don't really give it to them uh, other than making them think they're just learning a language and they're just going to be tested. And we need to change it. Now, let's just look at this little thing I made up. I did this. I made this up. And it's my way of capturing. This is all you have to do to, <laughs> to learn a language. You get some grammar. You learn some vocabulary. You get it by looking at some text or listening to something with your teacher. And then you do a bit of production skill. You write or you speak the language. And then, well, with the right book and the right teacher, you're going to have a chance to personalize that learning as those grammar and lexical areas are delivered to you piece by piece in your own way you express what you're saying in your world in your culture and you can obviously explore that by learning a language you open the window to other cultures as they say and so far so good that's we've just somewhere we've all decided how a language is broken down and in the way that we eat the elephant piece by piece we get there in the end or do we because this is what happens at school. You have this, in fact, it could be anybody's experience. Learning or teaching a language is too often, in fact, almost all the time, in my opinion, reduced to teaching English or another foreign language as a subject. And it's not a subject, it's a subject for us today. We are language fans. We thrive on analyzing grammar, perhaps, or we have a love of words, you know, and that's great. But that's not what we have in the classroom. Your primary and secondary learners, or even some of your students, don't really want to do all this. They just want to feel that they have a purpose. And I think the system makes students feel at the end of their course of uh, study, if they leave at 16 or 18, that all they did was just learn the mechanics of language as if we were swimming teachers. And they were hardly in the swimming pool, but they learned a, a heck of a lot about biomechanics and buoyancy. And there is a slide I sometimes show teachers. On the one hand, you have somebody swimming in water, having a lovely time practicing swimming. Another one is a diagram of buoyancy, the formula of something floating or the Archimedes principle. And I'm thinking as a, language, as a, as a swimming instructor, how much, how much would your swimming students enjoy a lesson if for the next 10 years they studied buoyancy and the biomechanics of swimming rather than being in the pool and different kinds of swimming, you know, in a lake, in a river, in the sea. But looking at this boring, deliberately boring slide, I want to sort of convey how the system around the world makes English and other foreign languages look like pieces of academic, you know, I don't know, a map to be sort of slowly eaten and it doesn't taste nice and when they get the practice it's difficult you go home with your workbook the parents are happy because they feel well my son or my daughter is now getting some good good old-fashioned working workbook practice and of course I don't think there's any evidence to say that workbooks help you learn a language it makes you feel that you you scored highly perhaps 
on understanding the grammar or some vocabulary at that point, but then you go on to another topic or another uh, grammatical area the next week and the next week and the next month and the years pass. And I, uh, it's very, very rare for students to experience practice in the classroom or at home that is easy. It's always a quick way to see, did you understand it? Because tomorrow we're gonna to be doing transport words with the future. And then next week we're doing food words and uh, should, could, and would. And, and fine, you know, we only have so much time in the syllabus and teachers will always look at me a bit nervously thinking, well, how much time do you think we have, Andy? And I'm saying, I'm, I'm just saying, how is it working for you? How is it working for us to give students this piece by piece grammar and vocabulary diet, which is necessary, but never really going beyond giving them a little bit of difficult gap fill practice and comprehension before moving on to the next thing. In other words, good course books do recycle and do progress tests through the, through the levels, but it's not enough. And we know it's not enough because we know that one of the things that teachers complain about so much is students can't remember, nor do they feel confident in the foreign language. And that's because we are quickly getting through a syllabus of language deconstruction without giving them a chance to see the language more often. It's always new language. Every lesson is like a new thing, followed by more difficult practice. And again, you're only young. You're like, you start at five or six, you leave school at 16 or 17, 18, and all you've ever known in language lessons is this, this, this academic approach, which is necessary, but it shouldn't be the whole story. And my, I'm gonna to come to balance in a moment, but the practice is always about being difficult. Why don't we make the practice easy as well as difficult? And you're gonna say why? And then certainly some teachers and parents push back hard saying, I don't want it easy. My son, my child, my daughter has to pass an exam. Don't make it easy. Well, I'm gonna say there's a, very, there's a very huge benefit for easy reading throughout a curriculum as alongside any other methodology and course book that you use. I'm gonna demonstrate why in a moment. But unless you do that, you're gonna have this Sisyphean task of pushing this rock, this big rock up the hill. And I, I don't know a single teacher of foreign languages who doesn't feel like this with their students because all the system seems to ask of you is to keep giving them new things with a workbook and a test for their whole language learning journey. And if it weren't for the fact that I really wanted to travel and I adored my father's uh, traveling life when I was a kid, I probably would have given up on French um, for this reason. It just felt, apart from embarrassing and unnecessary, because I didn't see the link between the real world and French because it was the 70s and we didn't easily you know, see videos of things like that. But a couple of school trips for me soon made it a real connection. But nonetheless, the approach to teaching languages is still this. And it doesn't have to be. Now, I'm just going to quickly talk here about reading in general. Uh, this person uh, is clearly reading on holiday, and they might tell me that um, they are a reader. Maybe they are. But I'm showing you this picture because this is not a reading habit. It may be if this person normally reads at home a hell of a lot, or a heck of a lot, rather. But when people tell me that they like to read, and I ask for a show of hands in a group, I without judgment, generally no, and I've been there, this has been me too, and that does look like a nice beach, by the way. Um, people generally say they love to read on holiday, and I say, yes, we all do, but that sounds like to me like you're not prioritizing reading. You wish, and I have a, a quick show of hands of how many people wish they had time to read. Now, I'm gonna talk about this just quickly now, because unless teachers are reading, as a pleasurable habit, giving it time, and it doesn't have to be a lot of time, then they're not role models for students. So then we have another problem. We're, on the, we're, we're first of all giving students lots of difficult reading. We're giving them only questions and essays at the end of it. So they hate reading because they don't get a choice of which book or which text. It's followed by questions and they don't hear the teacher really talking about how much they loved a book they just read. Let's be honest. I never really ask that question out loud anymore for answers because most teachers don't want to admit it. And I just say, look, 
we have to fight back uh, against the, the digital distraction that's making us feel that reading a book of 300 pages is a bit boring. <laughs> and that's a different session. Uh, but you know what I'm talking about, the, uh, the way that the smartphone and, and digital addiction has made us feel that sitting quietly with a book makes us twitchy and edgy. And I have fought back. And I remember telling an audience, I think maybe five or six years ago, that I had lost my reading habit through flicking through screens and all that stuff that we know is damaging. And if you want to be reading books again, and you miss books, and I did, and I mean reading for pleasure, getting through novels that you want, putting them down and giving them up if you don't like them, real reading habits, then we're not setting a good example for our students. And I always, I'm telling you now, I don't have the chance to see your faces or, uh, you know, really connect with you like I would in a physical classroom. But I would really honestly say to you, look, I'm not blaming you. I'm not criticizing you. I, but I did examine myself and think, my goodness, I am not reading my books anymore because I've become part of this digital thing, this this onslaught of digital distraction. It's messing with my head. I'm not concentrating. And I have fought back. Many people do, and I urge you to do it. And like all habits, they take time. Um, this is not a reading habit. This is a reading habit. This, this woman's gone for a walk with her dog. I don't think she's on holiday, really. And I think she's taken her book with her. Uh, she hasn't taken out her smartphone. That's a reading habit. There's a man there reading on the subway somewhere. He hasn't taken out his smartphone, he's taken out a book. That's a reading habit. And I think it sounds a bit, I mean, you can't, I can't see your faces, it's a bit weird, but um, you might be thinking I'm having a go at you really, but and maybe you're all fantastic readers who never stop reading and I'm glad. But let's pass on the message to others that sitting on holiday for two weeks reading your books is lovely, but it's, it's rare. I mean, who, if you get a holiday at all at the moment, finding time to read a book could be just 30 minutes a day. And if you read for 30 minutes, you've read about, let's say, I don't know, uh, 30 pages, okay? Or well, you can just do uh, 15 minutes a day. So 15 minutes reading your novel, that's 10 pages if you're slow. That's 30 days, that's 300 pages, that's a novel. That's 12 novels a year. And then I ask the rhetoric question to everybody, are you reading 12 novels a year? And by the way, that's only 15 minutes a day. For 30 minutes a day, you could be reading 24 novels a year. And I would say also, personally, you put away those books you don't like, get them from the library. If you don't like the book, put it back. Uh, and some people will say, I like to finish the book. And I say, OK, my wife is like that. She reads very quickly, even if she doesn't like the book. And I think life is too short. But where is this habit being taught in schools? You know, I know there's a bit of a pushback to be done regarding smartphones, but where is the pushback? And this all comes back to the teacher being the role model. How can we possibly expect our students to be reading for pleasure and all the benefits that we know come from it, both uh, intercultural and knowledgeable and linguistic benefits, as well as language learning benefits, and that's coming up next. Where is all that if it's lost in all the academic delivery of pieces of language followed by tests and no opportunity for the students to see that this is a reading habit getting through books instead of feeling a bit bored I'll take out my smartphone and here's the thing here's the thing just because people tend to sort of think well you know smartphones it's quite hard isn't it I go, well yes but before smartphones and before social media teachers still told me they had no time to read and if you're on social media or you use a smartphone, well, rethink how you spend your time. I'm not saying don't go on social media and I'm not saying don't use your smartphone. I'm saying if you want to get back to your books and if I am talking to you and you feel a bit bad, don't feel bad. OK, it's always a new day tomorrow to start again. Make a date with your book. I mean it. 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the evening. And I say to teachers and anybody who will hear me, if you find that hard to find, well, that's tough. That's a really difficult problem, isn't it? I did have one teacher who said to me, I don't even like reading. And he's an English teacher. And I didn't, I didn't know what to do with him. Now, I'm sorry for all that little bit of ranting, but I do feel strongly that we can't expect students to follow 
this next part of the, uh, the, pr the process of reading more in school and reading more at home when we think that they won't want to if we don't do it either. And the reason they don't want to do more reading is because we've made, given them the impression that we're too busy. There are other better things to do, like watching Netflix all the time. And also the only reading they've seen so far for years has been short texts chosen for them by a book followed by questions and it doesn't work. And those people who don't do this and do what I'm about to show you have better lasting results. See, here's a chap who's, maybe he's reading a novel on a phone. Maybe I shouldn't be so judgmental, but I do look a little bit over people's shoulders and I notice they're mostly not reading novels on smartphones. And there's a moment where he might be feeling bored. Why doesn't he take out a book? He can take out a smartphone nine times out of 10 on a subway one time out of 10, he could read his novel. You see what I'm saying? Now here, my, let, I want to introduce you to my mum and dad, lovely people. Unfortunately, my mum passed away last year, so I'm not going to go into that too quickly because it's quite sad. And my dad is in a care home nearby, but they have their, their whole life remembered this word from my days in Germany. Uh, I can't remember your name, your lovely colleague there from Augsburg. You want to put in the chat what that means? Mrs. Lady from Augsburg? Katarina, yeah. Yeah, what does omelette um, mean? Uh, it, it means that you can't drive straight away. You need to take another road yeah. because there, there's a building site on the way, something like that. Exactly, like a diversion, yeah? Diversion, yes, that's the A, a, a diversion uh, or a detour. And um, you might think, well, that's, not the first, that's certainly not the first word you learn in a German. Yes, detour, Christina, thank you. It's not the first word you learn in, um, in learning German in unit one but it was my parents' first word because they drove to see me a few times in the 80s when I was teaching English in Munich. They learned Ausfahrt, which of course we thought was hilarious because it sounds like fart, which means exit. And then there's <laughs> one light on. And let's state the obvious here. Why did they learn those words so quickly? Ausfahrt, exit on the motorway, and Umleitung when they were driving. What do those two words have in common apart from they're on the roads? Anybody? What did my, my, they, well, did they need the words? No, well, maybe, no, actually, uh, Katharina, frequency, yes. They didn't need the words because they probably saw the word omleitong and had no choice but to turn right. So didn't need it, they probably wondered. In fact, let me tell you, they used to think until they first arrived that omleitong was a city they didn't know how to pronounce it. And they asked me, where is this? Every, every sign points to this place. It's bigger than Berlin. And I said, which sign? And mum's going, um, um, what was it? And he's going, my dad's going, um, um, like, and I went, um, like, um. yeah, that's it. Where is it? It doesn't mean, it's not a city. It's a diversion. Now we laughed about it because it's kind of funny, but laughing about it wasn't memorable enough for them to remember that word. But they drove many times to Germany even after I left Munich, and they saw the word many, many times, like Ausfahrt, like me. Look at this. I don't know much Spanish, but I know the, car, the word for car park is estacionamiento. And I've even worked at the pronunciation, but of course I didn't know that. And I even know the Arabic for stop. Again, this is me in a car, traveling a lot and seeing signposts. Now, we all know that this is how it happens. And this is a vital thing to sort of go back to. And however obvious this sounds, oh, Andy travels. Well, my students can't travel and see all these words. They have to go into a school. Well, we can replicate frequency if we just introduce more repetition than we think is possible. And the repetition of language, including structures, can happen and does happen if we stop giving them all the tests all the time and balance it with a chance to see the words over and over and over again without boring them. At the moment, they just get lists to learn and that's not what the brain likes really and it's a bit boring. But what would it be like if the students as part of their learning with that teacher or ideally with that whole Ministry of Education implementing it, that alongside the difficult language learning and the workbooks which have their place, there is a parallel system of reading things that they choose, topics that they all 
they all like different things, don't they? They have different tastes. They don't all like horror films. They don't all like Jane Eyre. Some teachers tell me, oh, I give my students Pride and Prejudice. I love Pride and Prejudice. I go, have you asked the students? And if they say it's in the exam, I say, okay, you teach it because it's in the exam. Have you asked the students what else they'd like to read? No. And I'm thinking it starts by finding out what they like, but then we give them a chance to read at their level. And that is something that causes a lot of controversy. How can we let everyone read at their own level? Because we assume that the, the class is at the same level. And of course, we know that they're not. Anyway, for the time being, frequency is how we learn a language. That is the fastest way. The fastest way is to, uh, to go there, isn't it? Uh, go to the language where the language is spoken. Now, that's what people generally know, even if they don't know about language learning and linguistics, they, they say, well, have a, have a boyfriend or a girlfriend and go and live in the country and that's how you learn the language. Well, what's implied there is you will learn the language that is most frequent. There's no easy language. If you think about it, there's no such thing as easy words and difficult words. There's no such really word that you talk about low level language and high level. Well, look, Barry, Barry will tell you, I'm a great film fan. I love talking about films. I'd love to work in a film studio and understand all that. Now, if I went to go and work in, let's say, Mexico and, and worked in a, a film studio, it'd take me quite a while to learn the language uh, because I'd be going in out of work, deliberately learning the words of cameras and light and sound. But meanwhile, living in Mexico City, for example, I would be picking up easy words, but they're not. Hello and goodbye and thank you and, I, you know, I don't understand. These are not easy expressions. They're simply more frequent. So that's how we learn language. It's about the frequency that we are exposed to it. And you could be screaming at the laptop now to say, Andy, we know this. And I'm going, yes, we do but that's not the experience we give the students. We don't give them the chance to see things frequently. We give them something, we test them, and then we move on. And then we ask them to do a test next Friday based on looking at lists, and it doesn't work. Let's go back further. Let's go back to where we were kids, toddlers, little children of one, two, three, four, five years old. We learn daddy, hungry, mummy, toilet, I don't know. But we don't learn vacuum cleaner or, uh, you know, quantum theory. We learn the words we hear around us. Again, very obvious. But if it's so obvious that as young language learners, we, we listen to the same things again and again. And if by learning a foreign language, the best way is to go in the country because we are exposed to frequency, then what happened to all that obvious way of learning? If all we do is give students new bits of academic language with lists of words, followed by a workbook, and then a test next week, and then the next new thing. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't add up. How can we know this works, but not replicate it in systems around the world? Now, this is a text. I'm gonna just give you a little bit of background. What we need to do is give students, and remember, they won't like it at the beginning because we've got them thinking that reading is boring. But imagine a world where, and it, there are schools doing this around the world, sadly, a, a, a tiny minority, alongside their language learning, the grammar lessons, the vocab lessons, all the things that people do traditionally already that we believe is the only way. Imagine there was time put in for homework and part of the lesson, all right? Think how many hundreds of hours are taken up with language learning in school and homework. Well, let's take 20% of that or 10% because 20% of it doesn't really work anyway and allow that to be given to students to read in the class and in homework. And I know that there would be a big shock if you went in tomorrow and told them this, but I'm talking about creating a culture of reading in the classroom and a culture of reading below their level not at or above to challenge and challenge and push that rock up the hill because they feel like that. I want the students to be reading at or below their level. And by that, I mean, they read fiction or nonfiction with graded readers. And if you don't know what a graded reader is, uh, a, a graded reader is a, a title of a, a fiction, a work of fiction, original or um, adapted uh, or nonfiction that's been written so that the language level is beginner, intermediate, advanced, the level of the language 
if you like, has been made accessible for that student. In other words, if you gave them David Copperfield, the original, too difficult, but a graded reader would take the story, the characters, and some of the language and rinse it down to different levels. And there are thousands of graded readers. Forgive me if you know this, but I have to make sure everybody knows. And if you put this in front of them, you don't just have a simple story. Look what happens here. This is from Gulliver's Travels in the opening page. This is from uh, Ellie Publishing, a disclaimer. I'm a consultant for them at the moment, and I'll give you a link later. Now, you don't have to read all this, okay? Uh, you can see at a glance, it's an opening scene where uh, Gulliver is in the water and he swims um, and, uh, oh no. Uh, is it Gulliver's Travels? No, I think this is a Robinson Crusoe. I don't know, I can't remember. The point is the text is showing a bit of action, but look how often we are seeing words repeated. Now those people, and you can see structures too, was and wasn't, look how many times in two paragraphs, the students are exposed to was, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, including one negative form. Now that doesn't happen in course books because that's not the job of the course book. The course book is there to present new language, test it and move on and move on, pushing that rock always up the hill, but the rock rolls back down because we don't give them enough of this, which is a chance to see that language and, word, and the words at that level and in perhaps a story that they would like. And if you did a survey, we're gonna to come to a mini libraries soon, but if you're asked in a survey or a, a show of hands at the beginning of the year, who likes which stories, and you as a teacher, you know their different levels, you start to work with the students to give them a chance to look from a selection of purchased graded readers that allow for different levels and different topics so that then we do a very sensible and pretty common sense thing, which is to say to students, right, when we learn English in this class or French or German, whichever you're teaching, teaching with Andy, what I do is I teach the grammar, vocabulary. We do lots of things that are gonna be a little bit tough sometimes, but we always do some reading. Oh, I don't like reading. Now I know you don't like reading, because at the moment, you probably haven't had a chance to choose your own books. That's true. In my school, we have to read the same book and then we do questions. And I say, well, what we'll do is we're going to find books that you like. What do you like? Well, I love fantasy stories and Harry Potter. OK, Len. So when I come to looking at your books, so they all read their own books. And I'm talking about a selection of readers, which I can come to for uh, the purposes of giving the students a chance to do something they never do, which is to choose their own book put it back if they don't like it, and um, read without stopping. And the whole point of these graded readers, it's not just to make a story simple, it's to give the students a chance to see words frequently, to really reinforce the learning at their level and not demotivate them by thinking, I can't finish this, I don't understand it. And whenever they see text in course books, they generally feel overwhelmed already because they are seeing a text for the first time and they have to start all over again with new vocabulary and new grammar. And I say the system's wrong to do that. It needs to do that on one level, but where's the extra practice to see it? It doesn't happen in a workbook because also we will know that when we give students a workbook and they get 10 out of 10, if they did the same exercise a month later, they won't, it's gone. And unless they've been very, very keen and kept revising in a boring way, the way to consolidate this kind of language acquisition is by exposing them to the same words. Um, and I do tell people, I say, look, when you do read, you know, if you don't like a book, you can swap it, right? Yeah, I don't like reading books. I don't find interesting. I want to change them. And I, we need to teach that too as a reading habit. So we want to go into a balance, really. We want to, this is what happens only at most places teaching English or foreign languages, they see texts which are short and difficult, followed by tests. Nobody gets a choice about topic or level. There's no variety. And there's, they're sort of limited. They're very limited in the sort of range because then you're on to something else. And I would argue the case, and I must emphasize, I am only uh, a messenger of this idea of extensive reading, which has been going since the 80s, certainly, uh, and onwards, called extensive reading. Now, extensive reading is the opposite. It's a chance, you're not, let's go back a bit. Intensive reading is when we give the students a text to read 
because it's going to be difficult because it's new language. Extensive reading are longer texts, but they are, the students are only asked to read those texts which are longer. It's a story, but hey, if it's at their level or below, they're going to feel motivated by finishing the story. And along the way, look at all the narrative structures they're going to see. He said, she said, they went, he went, off he went. He walked and walked and walked. I mean, the repetition of language isn't just vocabulary. People think reading increases vocabulary, and it does. But the job of graded readers is not to increase vocabulary. Uh, it's or even to test. Some people use graded readers and do tests. Please let it be something that is pleasurable. And whilst the students think, oh, oh, I guess not all language learning is easy, uh, is, is difficult. It can be easy too. You know that they're getting the exposure they need. So extensive reading is giving them a chance to choose their own fiction, non-fiction, which is graded and it's easy. And you tell them, don't pick a book if you can't understand it. And if you can understand it, but you don't like it, change it. That's what we do in the real world. In other words, just because school has been a certain way for so long, it doesn't make it right. Um, so that's balance. And I think that's, that's the deal breaker. Um, and we're going to come to some of the pushback here. I mentioned that really it comes down to choice. I asked teachers around the world, again, without judgment, but to think, to go away and think, can this change? Why shouldn't it change? Why not ask the students what they'd like to read? Of course, there are set books, but there's plenty of opportunity to get the students to say to, say to them, you know what, when you're teaching with me or learning with me for the year, I'm going to let you, you've got to do this book for the exam. Sorry about that if you don't like it. We're going to do our best, but you are going to read other things for homework. But I promise you, you don't have to read a book that you don't find interesting or you can't understand. There might be a couple of tricky students who say they don't want to do anything and we can handle those in our own way. That's more of a discipline issue. But from the point of view of motivation, when have those students ever been told it's OK to read only something easy? And if they don't like it, they can swap it. This is the publisher I'm working with at the moment, and they represent Ellie is an Italian publisher of many languages and certainly very powerful range of graded readers. And just at a glance there, you can see different covers and topics. And I do workshops around the world to engage teachers, to engage students, to talk about covers, to talk about pictures and get them into the story. Because sadly, one of the jobs at the moment is to, to rebuild the student's belief about reading, that it can be fun, it can be owned by them, and it's not for swats and clever geeky people. Reading is for everybody, and I think that that elitist thing has come from making reading only difficult at school because it's believed that only through reading will you get a chance to see the language and, and see it tested, and then you can do the workbook. But the evidence, and I say to teachers, if this feels uncomfortable to you at the moment because you haven't thought about it, Think about it, and I'm going to give you the, the tools to do it, some links to go and find out about extensive reading, because then, and only then, will you then see that what you've done hasn't really been delivering the results you need. And I say the old phrase, you know, the old expression, if you do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always had. And if you've got students who just still struggle, let's try giving them this as a balance. It doesn't have to replace course books. I know many schools that have given up course book teaching and only use readers, I swear, and they have results to show it. And when word gets round, other schools copy, but I think there's pushback and I'm gonna try and explain what we know is pushback there, but that doesn't mean we can't fight it. So the benefits are they get the exposure to language, they get motivated, they, they will tell you, they finished the whole book on their own and they enjoyed it. And then they're more motivated to talk about it. We know that, they get fluency, reading fluency. Uh, people, when they say they are fluent in a language, everybody says, oh, he's fluent in a language. Well, that assumes speaking. Usually that's implying a spoken element, which means they can speak the language without stopping and keeping accurate, which is pretty hard. It's great to do and a long way to get there. But if you read a book with simple language, that's your level in your language, that your, the foreign language you're learning, like English, and you can read it and follow it and enjoy it without stopping, then you are reading fluently. And that is everything. It's motivating and it obviously embeds the language as it's repeated. It, of course, has an effect on writing skills later. And of course, we have all those other benefits that come from reading, like uh, learning about other worlds, 
culture's critical thinking and reading is, of course, its own reward. You don't read just to pass a test. You start to realize, as we started in the session, that there are great benefits and enjoying a book is, is one of the great pleasures of life. I also say, as many uh, trainers do, at least read to your students for five minutes in every lesson, okay? And pick a book that they like. Pick a book that's easy to, for them to understand. Don't test them. And it sets, it, it, it sets a good example. And it's, it's often done in such a way by teachers, they read it, but no one can follow it. The students get bored. Well, do it for five minutes and make it easy. This is not about testing. It's about getting students to follow a story. Secondary students, university students, primary. I think parents get nervous when they hear about stories in the classroom after, you know, into the secondary system. I'm thinking, no, stories are for everybody. Um, and if you read to students, then they're getting exposure to language. I mean, you probably know this, but students or rather pupils who go to school who are lucky enough to have a, you know, a, a, a books in the home where parents or, or carers or guardians read stories to them are already at a huge advantage when they get to school because they have been exposed to more and more words, not just the, the grammar and of narrative, but they've been exposed to so many more words. Well, if you read a story that they all enjoy to the lesson in the lesson, then uh, throughout their school life, they're gonna be exposed to more and more language. And if it's only a short graded reader, and they are short, if the students don't all like it, but most do, then you know there's another better one around the corner. So you ask them all what they'd like to read. Do you mean to read to them or ask them to read out loud? I'm talking about, a uh, good question, thank you, Christina, to clarify, and I don't wanna go on too long about it, but it's quite an important question now I see that. I'm telling, I'm saying here, as a teacher, read out loud to the students, read them a story, find out what they'd like, pick one from the graded readers, pick one that's below the level, so that what they're getting is simply a motivating listening experience with a story that hopefully that they enjoy. It's not about testing them, it's not about the questions and answers, but hopefully it's a bit of a thing that goes on. Um, I don't like uh, asking students to read out loud because it's not something that we do in real life. Um, I'm going to try and come back to Hassan's comments in a moment if I can. Uh, so that's, I'm just going to show you why this is important. It sends a message to students that reading is important. Instead of saying, they've all got the idea that grammar is important because all they get is grammar. Well, imagine they always realized, oh, when I learn English with Andy, I know that he always does a, a reading with us. Reading must be important. It sort of conditions them. And if I'm doing it with an easy text all the time, they'll learn that language isn't always difficult because they only ever experience difficulty. Why does every lesson have to be so difficult? Or rather, why does every part of every lesson have to be difficult? And I'm not trying to be their friend or just to give them super motivation either, although that is a benefit. It means that they are being exposed to easy language, which consolidates what you've done already. And of course, you choose the titles accordingly. It creates a reading habit in the classroom. They might remember forever that whenever they had that teacher, they always had stories, which they like, but deep down, you knew from this session or some further reading about extensive reading that it's actually benefited their language learning journey. It creates the habits and it does unite the class, you know, and they are short books. You can get through 20 or 30 stories in a year by doing this. It's only five minutes. It feels like there's no time. Well, I ask teachers to rethink how they spend their time. Could something go out the lesson every now and again? Because if this is powerful or as powerful as I know it is, it's worth doing. You have to take a chance, I guess, and try something new. Just quickly going to read Hassan. Mm, both as a learner and a teacher, this means that reading below one's level implies a combination of linear and non-linear discourse. Reading cannot be dissociated from the productive skills. Fair comment. Perception seems to be closely connected as with the experience of life. I'll come back to that if it's got um, uh, in the way of the reading out loud. I just want to say, to anybody there who believes it's a good thing to ask students to read out loud, I don't think it is. First of all, when in life do we read out loud? Where, who does that? Uh, politicians, maybe, teachers, um, religious leaders? I can't think of anybody else who reads out loud, like the way we ask students to, so it's not even realistic. 
then I could say, if you are going to be a religious leader, politician, or maybe a, a news reader um, or a teacher, when do you ever read out loud without being given a chance to look at the text first? But teachers don't do that either. They just make, they point to them. Not you, read, read, one, start, you start. And then guess what's happening? This poor chap is reading here. The others are doing a number of things. Either they're not paying attention, they're laughing at him, or some of them are worried because they think they're next. So they're not listening to him. Uh, they're waiting and preparing, preparing their next part. And then they're not chosen. So, oh, I didn't get chosen. I'll have to read the next bit. So no one's really paying attention. And this chap who first started, he's now glad the whole thing's over. He's not going to get picked again because he, he's done his thing. So he's not listening unless he starts talking and then the teacher picks on him again. So now you're using reading as a punishment. So the reading out loud thing, I feel very uncomfortable about. Plus, like I said, it's not a real activity. If you want them to read out loud for pronunciation practice, I would argue in front of 29 other teenagers, are you really giving your best pronunciation? Aren't you nervous? Wouldn't it be better to create activities? And in a different workshop, I do this. I give students each a chance to prepare their reading out loud, perhaps do it two or three together. But if they must do it, I've given them a chance to prepare. And actually with technology, I would rather they did that and sent me the audio file from the peace and quiet and relaxation of their home or somewhere without the pressure of the class, because I don't believe that reading out loud is pronunciation practice. There's also evidence and common sense tells us that's not the case. Teachers sometimes don't like that when they hear me say it because that's what we do at school. It's a school thing. But ask yourself again, you know, is that really gonna help anybody? When do we read out loud without preparing first? And um, I remember as a child hating it and wishing I wouldn't be picked on. Um, yeah, but Christina, great point. How can we know they pronounce the words correctly? Well, I would argue there's lots of ways throughout the curriculum to see them doing pronunciation practice. But I, I'm sure, I, I'm sorry we can't chat like this, you know, in this situation. But do you really believe that asking a student who's on the spot, spotlight, with the others listening, they're going to be at their very best? They're going to be nervous. They don't, they're going to think, make a mistake. You, you're going to correct them probably. That one-to-one -one is just so boring for everybody else. Go around and listen to them talking, reading out loud to you. Give them an activity that's right when it comes to some writing practice for something. Go around and say, right, Maria, how about you do some reading for me now? And, you know, there's some one-to-one. -one. You can orchestrate your many, many lessons so that you have that maybe one-to-one -to, -one to hear them pronouncing or reading out loud. But when do students, when in life, do we want to read out loud? Don't we really want them to be doing speaking practice? Um, that means if I do want them to read out loud, I give them some time to prepare and I don't do it with the pressure of all the others listening in a quiet classroom. Um, and again, teachers will still insist, no, Andy, you're wrong. And I'm going, but am I? Aren't we just going with something that's always happened at school without thinking it should be reconsidered? Um, well, but are some of them nervous? Okay, I can't have the chat, I'm sorry. But yeah, some of them love it. Ask me, teacher, please, please. Yeah, the extroverts. But can you be certain that 100% of every student you ever teach is comfortable reading out loud? And even if they are, when in life do they need to read out loud without the, the chance to at least prepare? So if you insist on making them read out loud, give them a chance to read maybe the evening before, which might make them nervous which kind of answers my point. But anyway, uh, we can disagree on that one. But have a think, is it really pronunciation practice or is it just, uh, you know, feeling I've got to get this out of the way for my teacher? Um, can't stay too long on that, but I did. And I've got to finish soon. But you do get results from reading to the students and it gives them a chance to see that reading lies just as much at the heart of uh, teaching a language and learning a language than any grammar-based approach. It's a balanced thing. It's a balanced thing. And Christina, do come back to me uh, on that about, I've got some good things to send to you that would argue the case against reading aloud the way it's done traditionally. Because I think teachers tend to use reading aloud to control the class because everyone has to behave themselves and be quiet. And that's not what reading is for. We don't use reading to, to, to police and discipline the class. We, we may think it's a pronunciation 
exercise, but it's not. It doesn't really give them a chance to show what they can do. They'll feel too too bad. But yeah, okay, okay, Christina, I get I get it. It's no problem. Uh, you may I don't know how you teach. I'm just ask. I, all I ask is teachers to think: what is a realistic reading aloud activity? Could we do it in such a way that it's meaningful in their day-to-day -day life? And are all the students really giving their best pronunciation when everyone's watching them and the others are really just twizzling their hair and not really listening? Uh, but, okay. Now, what's stopping us doing all this extensive reading? Well, we have to rethink the curriculum and how we spend our time. Um, people feel that the only way to teach is using a course book because that's what the parents expect. But we all know that we supplement course books and we chop and change as we need them. And there's also a feeling that teachers often, I get the feeling many of them, uh, and I've been, I've heard a lot of them talk about this, they feel that students aren't learning unless I teach them. You know, they're not learning unless I teach them. Well, we know that they like to learn on their own. And um, this whole idea of extensive reading is to trust that they will read more as they get used to the idea that they can read below their level. And it's not about being pushed and challenged too far. So it involves asking teachers to rethink what they may have done for a long, long time in exchange for something that will give benefits they've never seen before. Are you willing to take that chance? Because the chance actually isn't a risk at all. And I can certainly put you in touch with many case studies around the world in the past and ongoing that say extensive reading outweighs grammar-based teaching through course books by a long, long way. And the evidence is just, you know, done through... Um, monitoring their reading, monitoring their reading speed, and seeing how groups of students who don't do extensive reading underperform compared with those who do. So I'm not talking about something that's a general quirky idea. I feel so strongly that if the evidence is there that has improved results, why not try something different? And unfortunately, many school systems are private systems, or even in state schools, the parents don't like it. And teachers, teachers tend to feel we can't upset the parents. And I say, well, parents aren't teachers. They, they went to school, but they sometimes feel they have an opinion about what, how you should teach. You know that. And I drive a, a, a car, but that doesn't make me a mechanic. And I feel we have to sort of follow what we know is good for teaching and let the parents sort of be in the past with what they got. Because then I would say to the parents, frankly, how do you feel? Do you read a lot? Did you enjoy your English lessons? And if they are really honest, they might say, well, not really. It always seemed very hard. The reading was difficult. And um, I don't really read much. I haven't got time. So we are the ones to make the change and create a new culture. So start a class library. I have to finish now, I think. And that means looking for the funds through uh, looking how you spend your budgets, maybe some fundraising. Um, allocate the money towards getting a little box or a, a bag even some teachers who absolutely know this works, they ignore the school if the school says they're not prepared to do it. They ask parents to say, look, will you buy one reader? Give me just five euros for life for the school. And if 30 parents give five euros, you've got a library. And that's a book and a library for life. That's not every year on top of all the other books. That's just for life. And it's a price of a large cappuccino. And I, I'm rushing a little bit, but this is how you get the library to start. Those teachers who know this works and they can't change their system, they get their own little mini libraries and they know that it works. So get to know it. Don't just take my word for it. Um, Google extensive reading if you haven't heard about it and try it. it and try it like everything else. It's new. Try small. Pick a few students or one class and try it. It'll take time. You'll make mistakes, but get to know extensive reading. It is an absolutely wonderful thing. There's articles out there. In the slides I send, I'll send some more links on why extensive reading is good for our students, but why so many schools just won't do it. It just feels wrong, but it isn't based on evidence. It's based on a gut feeling that traditional teaching is what we do. But extensive reading is a game changer. And I've been spending many years telling teachers to get involved and talk to others who made the change, who didn't believe it either. Um, and join Facebook groups, for example, or, or go to this website, er-central.com. And I'll rush the slide a little bit there, sorry. But you'll see there that all the teachers who never used to believe it was possible have done this too. How to monitor if they read, how much is good reading, what is a reading speed? And it's something that's going to be something that takes time, but it's not the methodology. 
it's something that's just simply missing in language teaching. Everything else is fine. I'm not, I'm not arguing about different methodologies or whether course books are good or bad. I'm saying if we know that frequency and easy access to the same language over and over again reinforces learning, it's missing in the systems around the world, except those who have done something about it. And those are people have got together. And one of the main communities is Extensive Reading Central and highly recommend that take some time maybe over the next few weeks to get to know Extensive Reading and try it a little bit. Um, on my own website, on eltconnections.com, that's my website, I've put out the best books on understanding this there. There's some easy reading, there's some heavy reading if you want it. There's loads on this. And if you really are willing to change what, we've, what you might feel is just this, if you feel you're pushing a rock up a hill in teaching students a language and you think there might be another way, this is another way and it works. And I, I feel very, very passionate that even though every hundred teachers I meet, only one will change, that's hundreds of students forever in that teacher's life. Uh, and the reason I have to push the heart, push the message so hard is that it's, it's so against what the system believes is a language teaching journey based on unit by unit of course books with workbooks, when in fact, easy reading parallel makes all the difference. So um, please get to know extensive reading, take your time, it, there's no hurry, but you'll see what I'm on about if it's new to you, give it time and trust that it works. And I hope that you will at least give it some thought and maybe consider that what is missing is the balance. Not that everything you've done is wrong necessarily, I'm not saying that at all, I don't know you, but um, if you feel there's something missing, which is students don't leave school liking reading or they keep forgetting their language work, well, this is an answer and it's a trusted one too. So I've gone five minutes over, I apologize, but I'm happy to take questions if there's time. And I hope um, I haven't ignored anybody along the way. Um, I'm here still if anybody wants to talk or chat uh, or bring up again a point I may have missed or a question you'd like to ask. It's my pleasure to do that. Andy, thank you very much. As I told everybody before you started, impassioned, exciting, and really good. And I'm just going to read the uh, reaction from Hassan, who said, if easy and associated with clear goals, absolutely wonderful thoughts. Thank Far you. from the didactic approaches, which make reading a boring task, reminiscent of punishment, summarizing exactly what you've been saying, and very successfully. So thank you for that, Hassan. And thank you too, Andy. Any questions from anybody? Uh, now is a very good time to ask. Otherwise, we'll close it down quietly. Okay. I Excellent. think actually, Andy, we, we're on time. And unless you have anything you want to add, I think well, we'll um, pass it back. No, um, um... it's so sad to close it now. We, we are really impatient to hear more and more about this wonderful topic. And <laughs> you are wonderful, Andy. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Um, well, I suppose my parting, my parting two things to say, really. Um, one, this works, but it needs to a huge mind shift it, but the, if you follow the logic of those slides and the books that i can recommend and the links that i've shared with by people who've gone before me it works mm. but the feeling for most people is well i don't know really that seems like a big move now well change big big important changes do take bravery and risk and effort and resilience does that mean we shouldn't try? And anyway, it isn't a risk because when you read those books or any simple blogs about extensive reading, you will see that it's not that what you've all done is wrong because I don't know you, but if you've only ever, if you've never given anybody a chance in your classes to read easily and often for 10 years, then give it a go. And it doesn't mean changing everything, it means adding something simple. And the slides that I'll send to you, I'm more than happy to um, you know, send more information at a later date. The second point I want to make is please know that in the speed of delivering the presentation, I'm assuming you know, that every point has to be made, but I don't want to sound like I'm trampling on your own teaching methods and your own passions of teaching. Uh, far be it for me to say what's right and wrong in the way you teach English or a foreign language. 
All I'm saying is that I've noticed in the last 20 years of going around the world that most teachers don't know about this. And when they do hear about it from me, they start to feel a bit uncomfortable, like it's too much of a change. And that's when I feel a bit sad because if only they knew what the others have done and written about and applied and got the results. Because if you want results, isn't it worth a change? And a change that's guaranteed to work because it's been done before us. So I don't want to offend anybody by being by sort of being very uh, almost uh, evangelistic about it. But I do feel it does need. I've learned from experience this talk needs a push because it's so easy to go back to our old ways, which is pushing a rock up the hill. And maybe you get good results, but wouldn't you like them to be better? And that's my final comment. Thank you very much. And I'm happy to sit around and take questions. Um, and I'll put out my slides to uh, Barry, I suppose. That would be a lovely thing to do. Yeah, and what we'll um, do is add them to the website so people yeah. can download them from the website. And this change in your teaching to add this, it doesn't happen overnight. No. But all the best changes take time. So extensive reading is fantastic. And um, I wish I'd known about it when I was a kid. Mm. And uh, fight back if you feel your own reading habits have been spoiled <laughs> by the way smartphones make us feel bored. Uh, instantly without doing something, then keep your book yeah. and fight back. Get back your reading fitness. <laughs> okay. Tremendous work, Andy. Wonderful. I noticed that during your presentation, you mentioned, of course, reading extensively opens you up to other cultures. And just a quick word about next month, when we have one of the leading cultural teachers and writers in the world coming on our um, uh, webinar, Richard Lewis, who is actually listening today and getting a feeling for what's going on. Richard, I hope you found this valuable. And he will be here to talk about changing views of culture and how we need to rethink our approach in that area. And I think this is going to be, like Anders today, a groundbreaking and really, really valuable seminar. So we look forward to seeing you then for that. Let me now thank again, Andy, and let me now hand you back to um, Özlem, who will close the session down. Thank you, Barry. And Andy, thank you for a great informative session. And thank you all for joining us today. And uh, goodbye to everybody. Bye. 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 Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Thank great you. Great to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Goodbye. Bye. I would like to, to thank ICC for offering us this opportunity. Take thank care you. and all the best to all of you, Oslem and Barry and, and the team. Thank you, Hassan. It's great to see you here. It's so great to see you all uh, together. Yeah. Have a good time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.